Up next, we have Pache, who will be talking to us about yes, how your development practices affect your team. Um, while <coughs> Mache is busy setting up, um, I'm out of jokes, so I'm not going to call on you. I'm going to say a thank you. <laughs> uh, David, get your ass up here. <laughs> so I just really wanted to say thank you for David to David, who's been uh, running everything, chairing everything on the organizing committee um, this year. Uh, I know exactly how stressful it is. Uh, trust me, it's very stressful. Uh, thank you, David, for organizing everything. Uh, we were left with all the tools, a lot of experience, and he's still here, so we can ask the important questions. Thank you. No, it's fine. I'm not going to do any coding, so... Oh, actually, over to you. <laughs> okay. Should we go? Yeah. Uh, JP, ready? Cool. So, uh, if the theme looks familiar, it is because I stole it from Armin, I would admit up front. Uh, so... Ooh. <laughs> How is that supposed to work? Okay. Hello. I wonder if all the slides will fit. Anyway, uh, my name is Maciej Fiokowski. I come from Poland. That's hence the strange surname with uh, strange Unicode characters. I live here down the road. And you might recognize me from the PyPy project. Uh, so recently I've been doing less PyPy technical work and more fundraising, consulting, making sure that uh, people like Armin have money to work on cool stuff. Uh, Barocksoftware.com is our website. Uh, we've been running this for, I don't know, two, three years, something like that. And after that, I think I have quite a bit to say about uh, teams and code quality. Uh, so there has been a whole lot of things said how you assure the good quality of code. Uh, but there hasn't been enough said about, well, but what does it actually mean? How the team reacts to various methods of ensuring code quality? So let's assume that productive teams are happy teams. I don't have any hard data on that, but I think so. Uh, so background, I'm going to speak mostly about the open source development. Uh, I've done quite a bit of PyPy. VMProf is a, a profiling tool that uh, me and Richard has been working on, on quite a bit. Uh, VMProf is a tool that you see if you use PyCharm these days for profiling stuff. Uh, I worked some on CPython. I think Larry would disagree, but I did submit some patches uh, and twisted. And uh, recently, I've been porting Mercurial to PyPy. So uh, I did s quite a bit of open source work. And there, I feel very strongly about various processes. Uh, so PyPy has been going on for, Marmin said, what, 12 years, 13 years, something like that. I've been involved in the project for the last decade, uh, and I have lots of ideas about fundraising and management that I'm going to tell you now. Uh, so caveat, caveat, a lot of it might not apply to the closed teams, because if you have a closed team, you can tell people what to do. Uh, so you can tell them, like, sit down and tell them, like, review that code now. This is much more difficult in open source setting. But also in closed teams, telling people what to do makes them less happy. They would be more happy working on stuff that they feel like working on. It's not always feasible, uh, so, but some of it might apply to closed teams more and some of that might apply to the closed team less. One thing that's very important to remember is that everybody, ha a lot of people have forgot, uh, forgotten, but everybody's a newcomer at some point. You come to the project, whether you are just hired or you start a new project or you join an open source team, you're a newcomer. The first experience, how you see the world from, from that project will shape the whole, uh, your whole story, how you, how you work with the project. And for a lot of things, projects die because nobody feels good coming to the project and working with it. I think there can be made, I can think about a professor that 
you can think of a good research institute made entirely out of people who quit their job because they fell out with the professor. This is not the experience we are looking for. We want the project to be welcoming uh, and to be successful, you need to be welcoming, I think. Maybe not, but it helps. This is not scientific research. I'm going to talk about how I feel about stuff and I haven't done proper studies. I haven't even read proper studies about how people feel about <laughs> software engineering. Uh, but all the projects are different, so it's hard to do scientific studies. And it's very hard to do sound statistics on a team of three. Like every statistician will tell you that, that, that that's just a lie. It's not going to happen. So voiced opinions on the project matter and even more so unvoiced opinions on the project because a lot of people do things but not say what they actually, why, or not realize why they were upset with something. Uh, so what makes developer happy? It's a difficult question because it depends on the person, but let's try. Ability to feel empowered. Like we've seen a lot of like, whoa, cool. Can I just like go and write a new backend for PyPy? Or can I like work in this deep corner magic of JIT, understand it and do something? That that what makes people very excited about their work. So combination of feeling cool stuff and feeling empowered is what I think makes a lot of developers happy. Uh, sure, there are other ways, like getting paid a lot of money, uh, but this is not the case in open source anyway, so whatever. Uh, but let's focus on the developer happiness when depending on the kind of work that they do. So ideal scenario is where everything is super nicely tested. Deployment takes no time. You can test your stuff in 15 seconds or less, but you can hack as much as you want. This is the very ideal scenario that I would like at least to see. It's obviously impossible because it's contradictory, but how close can we get to that? Uh, so ideal system, as, at least as described, has code reviews, pair programming, tests, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment, but also short iteration times. Uh, short iteration times here are very crucial. Uh, so th this is the typical, typical. I think some points fell off the list for whatever reason. I blame presentation tools. Uh, so first you find out what has to be done. This is sometimes very hard to do actually, but let's say that this part wasn't too hard. Then you try to do it. Then you eventu eventually succeed and like, okay, fine, I've done it. Then you try seed fail, you debug, test, and repeat, then commit and deploy. How it actually looks like. It's actually quite funny that things fell off the table down because it makes sense now. Uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> you try to find out what has to be done, you try to do it, and then you spend time on Facebook or reading Hacker News and you wait for tests to complete or a code to compile or for somebody to like, look at your patch. My favorite story is about a developer that will not be named, uh, working at a bank that will not be named. Uh, so he didn't have permission to compile his code. So he was writing in C++, which requires compilation, but he didn't have permission to compile it. Only his manager did have permission to compile it. So he would write a piece of code, look at it very carefully, and think that it will compile, then send an email, and wait for manager to compile it, come back with a compilation error. He said he never read that many books in his life in a month. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how sometimes the development workflow look like. You're trying to find out what, what has to be done. It's two line fix, you do it, and then you wait 30 minutes for the test. Or you wait two weeks for somebody to find it on the back tracker. Or you wait forever, that happens too. And that was very prevalent in the era of punch cards. I didn't see that, but I, I believe it was so. So let's not get, go back there. Let's try to keep it shorter than the time that it takes to scan the punch card and like print the punch card and stuff. <laughs> so what can be optimized? Everything. Trying to find out what can be done can be optimized, like by better documentation, by better backtracker tools, but finding like what, by better communication tools essentially. Uh, I'll focus on the iteration here. And uh, I think there has been a lot talk about iteration. The iteration really depends on technical, technical 
complexities of a project. Like, if you're working on a telescope, like some of us here do, uh, then sometimes you have to drive to the telescope, plug it in and see if it works. Like, that cannot be shortened very easy. The telescope is like eight hour drive from Kenya. There are flights now, right? Where is Neilan anyway? Yes, there are flights. Uh, so that, that, that's, that's a way to optimize all this process, right? Having flights to the site for the telescope. This is the solution that they deployed to making the trying stuff quicker. Uh, for most of us, it's slightly easier than, than chartering an airplane. So let's focus on that. Uh, so I'm going to show you bit by bit uh, the open source project by example. Uh, because speaking about examples is always good. Uh, so I picked PyPy, CPython, Mercurial, and Twisted, which are the projects that I contributed to in the past few years. Uh, I'm going to criticize some of it. It's not a critic of the project. It's a critic of the processes that make it really hard uh, or harder than necessary to contribute to something. Uh, so speaking of the project quality, I think it's fair to say that all of those four projects are generally relatively high quality. And maybe I wouldn't like to send, send stuff to Moon using my JIT. Uh, but the quality is reasonably high. I would definitely deploy cat pictures on that. <laughs> Which is uh, apparently this is how we define these days high availability software. Can it serve cats 24-7? Uh, it's true. <laughs> so I claim that, that all of the software is done uh, at a relatively high quality, but the processes that uh, lead to that quality are very, very, very different uh, from each other. So I'm going to describe the processes and see like what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, what are the, the benefits and what are the problems with all those processes. At the end of the day, is your project welcoming to people, whether those are new employees or or new open source contributors or students who participate in Google Summer of Code. I think we get like half of our core developers are through Google Summer of Code. Or like pretty much everybody except you are mean these days. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's above half. So uh, uh, those things are really important. How do you get new people to contribute to a complicated piece of software? Uh, well, Google Summer of Code is one of the very good ways to do that. Now there is like. Another one like outreach program called Outreachy run by the PSF, unadvertised anywhere, I don't know why. Uh, that's, that does similar things. So, so like getting, uh, how do you get new people on board? In terms of companies, it's quite easy. You pay them money and they come. Like all this bullshit that people come to, the, to change the world, it's usually no, they are too poor otherwise to not come and work. Uh, so. It's easier, but it's still, how do you get people excited about the projects you're working on is a very important question, in my opinion. Uh, so is your project wel welcoming is something that I think is a very important question that we will try to answer. And I'll show you of all those projects how the process looks like, what they're deployed in, in place to ensure the quality, and how it works in practice. I'm obviously biased because I work on PyPay and I like PyPay development projects, so I'm putting that as a disclaimer. But this sort of stuff is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, one thing that's important to remember that in the place, Simon, maybe you know the citation for this, uh, but the, if there is no explicit power structure, there's an implicit power structure anyway, always. So flat structure means that the people who are official are unknown and unelected. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with having an official power structure. Like in case of PyPy, the official power structure is that uh, decisions should be done by consensus. And that has been the case always till now. But there's a procedure for not, uh, not doing stuff by consensus, which is a vote of simple majority of the voting members. And the voting members are people who contribute to PyPy and choose to have a vote, which seems to be a, very, a great pre-selection criteria so far. Uh, it's surprising. People who claim, to, who claim to want to have a vote are people who actually should have a vote. That, that, that makes sense. Uh, so let's talk about distributed systems a bit. Who did CS recently? Uh, hmm? who, who, who finished like, ComSci recently? 
So you should know all of this. Uh, there is a problem. Deadlock is one problem of distributed system. Starvation is another one. And fairness is optional but unnecessary. So like, uh, I think all of it presents itself in traffic, for example. Like, you cannot cross the intersection because the guy who needs to cross the intersection uh, waits for you, or like the cy cycle is bigger than that. There are three people gridlocked in the middle of the intersection, nothing happens. Starvation is when intersection is designed in a way, well, let's talk about teams. So like, deadlock is when team A waits for team B to finish something, but team B cannot start be because they wait on something else from team A, but they don't do anything because they wait for team B. Uh, Starvation, typical scenario in the open source world is you submit the bug and it disappears in the bug tracker and then gets like, dies somewhere there. Or it requires a decision and you post to a mailing list uh, and then there are differing opinions and no final decision. Nobody feels like, like there's, there's entitlement to make a decision. So nobody makes a decision. Decision is not made, patch dies out. Uh, Fairness is something that's less common and means that all people are subject to the same development process. I think it's important, not everybody thinks that, but I think it's important that everybody feels like the development process does not prefer some people over other. Uh, so if, if I were to implement unfairness in PyPy, I would prevent core developers from committing code f without the review and not newcomers. Chances of breaking the pipe I built are, Armin is the highest, and I'm probably the second. And it goes from like whoever commits the most code to whoever commits the least code. Newcomers are super careful, and the core developers are less careful, typically. <laughs> it's true, I'm looking at you. <laughs> tests, everybody likes tests. So, uh, the plus is that everyone has to write tests. Or, are there special rules for tests? Like there's some projects where only some people have to write tests. I find it deeply disturbing that there are people who can get away without writing tests, but the general project policy is that tests should be written. Generally speaking, proving lemmas about your code is useful, whatever the lemmas are. So one type of lemmas is that the type system is sound. Uh, and there's more useful or less useful type systems. Uh, tests prove things about your code. So say, if you write a test about, uh, I don't know, that your sort generates sorted lists of integers. You're gonna write a test that like, maybe it doesn't prove that the sort is right, but it proves that it's right for like seven different examples of a list. Uh, if you use a tool like Hypothesis that will generate test cases, then there's more cases. It still doesn't prove anything, but it proves that it works for more cases. Tests, good. Proving things, useful. Tests make developers feel m more confident. Like, if I change a piece of code that's not tested, I'm never sure, like, yeah, what did I do? Like, is it, is it broken? Does it work? How do I check it? Uh, if you have a good test coverage, then you just run tests and, like, and say, okay, fine, it must work, fine. The minus point that often gets forgotten is that long test runs are frustrating. And we are definitely like suffering through that in PyPy. If your tests run over five minutes, you're either not gonna run them very often, or you're gonna wait, or you're gonna procrastinate. Uh, in theory, you should be able to switch some other task and start doing some other code, but it almost never works. Not for me, at least. Continuous integration, just more of tests. The plus is that it makes you more confident about other platforms. The minus is that if continuous integration is not delayed, delayed as in you commit and then runs and you check it later, uh, it can increase the testing time significantly. So if you say it can increase your test time from five minutes to five hours, and, and then it's like, okay, but I can only do two commits a day or one commit a day, and that's, that starts to become problematic because then you are trying to limit the number of time you commit, so you're gonna do more experiments that are less tested, stuff like that. So continuous integration, generally good. Careful how you write it, uh, how, you, how you implement it. Code reviews. Someone looks at the code you wrote. Good, increases bus factor if nothing else. Uh, who doesn't know what's bus factor? 
everybody knows what's the bus factor. Great. Uh, and code review is very useful. People will look at your code. Minus can be potentially personal. Uh, I don't like this this person. I'll bike shit the shit out of out of his. No, it happens. Uh, the minus about and here the gentleman here would tell me that it's not true. Uh, there's a problem of community, not of the process, but I've seen this being systematic, is that uh, smaller harmless patches tend to get more code review than bigger, more complicated patches, which is counterintuitive. So everybody looks like, okay, I am, say I implemented a new dictionary implementation for PyPy. Uh, that's a big patch. And nobody feels like reading it. Somebody will run the test and be like, okay, okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> But if you change the error message and added a dot, and that would be like 700 people claiming no error messages will need a dot or don't need a dot. And <laughs> it happens all the time. Uh, another minus of code reviews is that people sleep. People are unreliable. If you're coding at like people sleep, people get sick, people do other things. How, how do they dare? Uh, if your code review is necessary for a commit, it means that you might wait very long before the, the code gets in, and people get lazy. That, again, can be, and, and commons can be forced with, with money. You no, know, I pay you to do that. Uh, and so, unsurprisingly, open source projects that have commercial backing tend to have code reviews that happen faster, because there are people paid to do that. Uh, but code reviews can mean long waits until your code gets in, and sometimes it just never gets in because you, you, you're like, oh, whatever, I'll just maintain a fork. It's much easier than trying to get this patch in. CPython. Let's, uh, CPython is very bug tracker based. Who tried to contribute to CPython? Who succeeded? Sorrow. <laughs> okay, CPython is very bug tracker based. So, Bug tracker base means that a lot of development happens through the bug tracker. You post a bug, you discuss this on the bug tracker, then things get committed or not, or the bug is closed or not, depends. Uh, code reviews are mandatory for newcomers, but not core developers. I find it's very disturbing personally. Uh, so people who are coming to the project have a higher barrier of entry than people who already are in the project. That should be the opposite in my opinion. Uh, and that also means that code reviews can kill a comment by somebody who is not a core contributor, but cannot kill a comment by somebody who is a core contributor. This means it's exclusive, uh, which is not good. It's hard to get a comment bit to CPython, so to comment stuff to CPython is relatively hard. Uh, easy to wait months or forever for a review. There are definitely bugs on the issue tracker. It has been improved quite a bit recently with the new tools and people getting scholarships and people understanding there's a problem and reviewing lots of tickets. Uh, but I, I had patches that lasted two years before getting committed, for example. And which means they essentially got forgotten. Tests are sort of mandatory, but not completely. There are some parts of CPython that, uh, that, that are less tested, some parts are, are more tested. They're definitely welcomed. Quick build time, slightly slower test, overall this is all quick. Uh, and note, like with all of this, this produces good working code. Like CPython, which everybody here uses, I'm pretty sure, is generally a, a relatively reliable piece of software. Mercurial. Uh, who is Mercurial here, actually? I wonder what's the... Few people. M most people use Git. Okay. Mercurial, who tr anybody try to contribute to Mercurial? Not really. They're very mailing list based. Uh, fun fact, Mercurial doesn't use branches. And I don't know why. Uh, so you write the patch, you send it to the mailing list. The comment bit is hard to get, but code reviews are mandatory and they're equal to everybody. So everybody gets gets code reviewed, including core developers. And there are people paid to work on it, which means that the code review process is relatively quick. Again, I run with Mercurial into problems that simple commits get discussed forever and hard commits 
that are buggy, for example, because I didn't know what I was doing, get in quickly without too much checking. Bad. Uh, the tests are absolutely atrocious because they're dog tests. Who likes dog tests here? Did I offend anybody? You like dog tests. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't like dog tests. <laughs> Twisted. Uh, Twisted is a network networking uh, library. Twisted uh, is very test-based. Everything is tested very thoroughly. Uh, the tests are very fast and they make a lot of effort into making sure that each single commit uh, runs all the tests. And that means that you need those tests to run under a minute, I think, or something like that, in order for every single commit to go through the testing process. It's very easy to get a comment bit because there is a very strict development process that applies to everybody. So the comment bit doesn't give you anything. You're, you're the same person, you just get to use better tools, but it doesn't give you superpowers. Uh, that makes people happy, actually. Like, here's the comment bit. It doesn't do anything, but here it is. Uh, it's empowering. Code reviews are very strict and mandatory. There's a long list of things that the comments uh, need to do. Tests are strict and mandatory. And to Twisted Defense, networking is really hard to get right. Uh, that is, networking is easy as long as everything works. <laughs> Try running networking software and then like plugging the cable out. Uh, things stop working in very random fashion and Twisted is relatively reliable with that. I find Twisted development process very frustrating for an occasional committer, uh, but Twisted managed to produce a high quality code that doesn't move very fast, but it's relatively high quality. PyPy is very test based. The tests are relatively slow. You never run all the tests, and we run into problems all the time because of that. Uh, the build time is slow, so well, but you don't need to build to, to run tests, so that's, that's a plus. Uh, what we did, because everything takes forever to run, we delay the continuous integration and we delay the review. So you're gonna commit, uh, commit stuff or merge stuff. Typically newcomers will ask for code review anyway, but if somebody commits stuff, we will review it on the mailing list and then try to fix it if it's broken post factum. This causes sometimes some trouble because you have to dig in back into the history and like check what was going on. But it means that the roundabout of doing development in PyPy is relatively short, even for people who are new to the project. And this is very important. Uh, JITs are hard too. So I think we did a relatively good job at making sure that they work. Uh, it's super easy to get a commit bit. It's almost as easy as committing one patch and asking for it. Again, it doesn't give you special powers. So I think our thinking was that PyPy is a hard project as it is. Writing just-in-time compilers is just hard. Let's at least make the development process easy. Uh, having a Swiss on the team helps a lot. Uh, in a sense that Swiss are very good at finding middle ground when it comes to discussions. This is why <laughs> we always found like sort of solution uh, to to a problem that, that looked unsolvable, that there were like two sides and they, they were conflicting. And Armin usually finds, finds a middle ground for that. Uh, if we could, we would reduce test time, build time. Uh, but it's really difficult. I would love to do that, I don't know how. But reducing test times, in a sense, yes, reducing test times is good, but having more tests is better. Uh, so I would reduce test times, but not at the cost of running on, of testing less things. Uh, so the, the, in my view, the development process of PyPy is relatively easy and tries to compensate for the fact that it's hard to contribute to a project because it's a hard topic. Uh, at the end of the day, the question that stays is like, is the contribution here a net win or a net loss? So a typical net loss contribution is like, hey, I have this idea that's completely stupid and I'm not gonna even implement it. I'm gonna go in ahead and discuss on the mailing list and consume everybody time. Or like, even worse, because if idea is stupid, you can dismiss it, but I have this idea that can be either very good or very bad, depending how you implement it, but I'm not gonna implement it. I'm gonna go ahead and discuss it on the mailing list. 
this is a net loss contribution. You should avoid those. Uh, but is the code contribution fixing things? Is it, is it improving things? Or is it not? And if it's net positive, then how about merge it and like try to work out the issues to make it simple? Uh, so we found out the process where if somebody contributes to code that nobody touches and nobody feels knowledgeable enough about that code to review it, we just merge it. And it's counterintuitive a little, but I don't trust myself any more than a random person on the internet. Uh, and if somebody spent like two weeks fighting with problems of the code, if it passes test, then well, pro well, I'll do basic things like check for name errors and like run PyFlex and run tests. It, if it seems to be a better off overall, then somebody who spent two weeks fighting with that problem is probably more knowledgeable about this code than anybody else. We do have pieces of code because the project runs for like 13 years or so that have a bus factor of zero, essentially. No bus needs to hit anybody <laughs> <laughs> for the code to be not known by any known human. <laughs> what do we do with such code? We accept people who want to maintain it. It's like, yes, yes, you don't know where you're going, but yes. <laughs> I think this is important, and, and I think this is something that I hit, uh, I, I touch obscure code in various projects. And I'm, I spend some time like profiling some project, and I'm like, Here's a small change to like somewhere deep inside that nobody knows anymore. And the guy's like, but nobody knows it anymore. We're not going to touch it. Well, but here's improvement. I can show you here numbers. No, but nobody knows it. And then you're in a deadlock because nobody knows it, but nobody wants to know it either. <laughs> so at the end of the day, like, I, I think the question, is this contribution relevant? Is it net positive? Is like the, the, the most important one to ask. So in summary, like what we found in the last 10 years of pipette development, the iteration time is crucial. Can you make the iteration time down? Can you take it down to a level where it's easy to, it's easy to contribute code? It's easy to write a piece of code, test it, commit it, run it, deploy it, whatever. Like in terms of pipette, we don't deploy it, but we run continuous integration. Uh, the frustration can come from both humans and robots. Like, Tests running forever, or like a, a, as David showed on the presentation, windows breaking, for example, is a fun, fun part of debugging stuff. Um, the interesting part is that the robots are really harder to hate. They don't sleep, they, they mean well, like they're too dumb to really mean badly. Uh, it's hard to hate robots, like if, if some Code review tool tells you that you forgot a name here. It's like, well, it's not true, but I can, they can't hate you anyway. Uh, with humans, it's difficult. It's easy to create a situation where uh, there's like some antagonization of newcomers, or there's a problem on the mailing list that can be resolved. If the processes are clear and apply to everybody, then like, well, this is the procedure list. Everybody should apply to that. I'm sorry we're not going to merge it, but if you provide something that follows those criteria, we would. And this is like the obvious criteria and the robots check that those criteria and we don't have to do it while we sleep, then it's easier. Well, that's, that's about it. Uh, are there any questions? Um, we do have time for a few questions. Uh, since you're right here, I'll give you the mic. The goal uh, is to go faster for drinks, I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, if you want to ask a question, I think let's take four questions. Uh, and yeah, hold up your hand. Um, do you have any thoughts on the importance of documentation to newcomers? I've found that a lot of the time when I'm interested in using a library, say, I'll go through the docs, go through the source code, and find that there's a lot of inconsistencies because it doesn't seem like they're tracking each other. Mm. Um, and that, that's sort of a barrier to, you know, contributing. That, that's I a very think. good point. So what I found, like, for example, this is slightly different because it's user documentation, but like uh, CFFI success, I think, partly is because it has good documentation. It's also a good library, but like it has good documentation. And 
breeding a culture where the documentation follows the code takes effort. It's like, it's like make, it's, it's a bit like writing tests, like making sure that things are correct. And it's difficult to, to check with robots whether your documentation and your code actually correspond to each other. So something that, that we found interesting is like, yes, there is documentation to explain why things are done, but not how things are done, because how things are done can be read from the code. But why things are done cannot be found in the code, typically. Uh, the best code comments, for example, that we have was Armin getting mad at Armin two years ago for not writing documentation and spending like a week trying to figure out what the piece of code does and then writing a long comment. <laughs> because you in the future might not remember what you in, in the present did. Uh, so yes, it, it's very important, I think, but it also, it's, it's a matter of culture and like, how do you develop culture? I don't actually know, like PyPad doesn't have amazing documentation, for example. Uh, but how do you develop culture where documentation is important? And, and one of the items that like is always, if you rush things, then things get cut down. And, and those things that do get cut down are things that are important for the future, not for now. So if you rush things, you're gonna cut down on tests, you're gonna cut down on docs, on proper code structures, stuff like that. So not rushing things maybe helps. Also may, might make people lazy. That also. Um, we have a question from JP. Um, given the difficulty of getting started with some of the stuff, as you've mentioned, some people might struggle to get the tool chain going or the build stuff or knowing what to do. Is there any kind of guideline that you can give people to consider for their own projects problem areas that you've seen people can start looking at to do that? Anything like that? Difficulty getting into the stuff. So like get, getting like build chain running is frustrating. What we found, for example, for that's very useful for scientists who like want to go, I mean, go ahead and like try your stuff without too much hassle. It's like you, you provide them with like VMs, like here's the VM, you run that command. Like you li literally download that, click play and, and run this command. With, when you want to run it on your own machine, this is the procedures that you have to follow, but we want to get you excited first. So th that sort of stuff, like how do you cut down in the chain? Like the, my favorite example is like, how easy is FreeBSD on the desktop? And then you see the documentation is like 40 pages long. How do you set it up on the desktop? That's not easy. <laughs> like 40 pages of documentation is never easy. So can you get it down to one to try things? Oh, would you say something like being in the era of containers is a good approach for that, possibly? Possibly, I don't know. I don't use containers. <laughs> 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 Sounds uh, like a good idea. Um, <laughs> Do we have any more questions from anyone further back? Um, oh, okay, uh, last question from Jessica. Are you coming to Namibia? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 